Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you for having me. And thank you for coming out on a Friday night to, uh, to spend some time with us here. I um, first want to thank the Memphis Astronomical Society, of course. And uh, what a great introduction. I haven't, um, I've, I've all, I consider myself a Teddy Roosevelt Republican. And so I've, I've always loved his conservationist views. And I have never, ever put myself in a sentence with him. So I'm, I'm really honored. Um, thank you. And, and I hope that, I can, that we can do him proud and protect these sites on the moon. Um, oh, I've got a clicker. So, so first, a little bit about me. I spent 25 years as a corporate mergers and acquisitions attorney in New York, Minneapolis, and London. Um, I ended up advising a lot of aerospace companies. Um, and that sort of grew into my, uh, or helped uh, my love for all things space reemerge. Um, now, I am a space lawyer. I teach aviation and space law at the University of Mississippi, where we are focused on encouraging the development of appropriate guidelines that will pr promote, rather than stifle, an emerging space economy and ease humanity's transition from a solely terrestrial to a spacefaring species. Among other things, the Center for Air and Space Law at the University of Mississippi School of Law is engaged in the exploration of the history of human migrations to better understand the evolution of the laws and moralities that create successful and sustainable civilizations. So we're looking at Polynesian migrations. We're looking at the migration from the East Coast to the West Coast. These are all place times where humans have explored and expanded. In so doing, we encourage the construct of an adaptive framework that will assure the reaches of space remain free for exploration and resource utilization, while also providing the stability needed to encourage continued investment in private and public space activities. I'm also the co-founder of For All Moonkind, an international nonprofit, non-governmental organization that is the only organization in the universe focused on preserving human cultural heritage and history in outer space. Just this year, we were honored to become one of 41 permanent observers to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, an important step for a mission that will need tremendous international cooperation to succeed. By the time I complete this presentation, I think you will agree that human heritage and its preservation must be deeply entwined with all aspects of space exploration and utilization, especially the development of human communities in space. And perhaps more important, you will agree that what you will soon learn is a very open issue regarding property in space can be suitably addressed, perhaps can be best addressed, by approaching the matter from a preservation angle. So For All Moonkind is about preservation, but we're also uh, inextric inextricably about the future. We believe preserving is the first step to creating a sustainable future. So while I'm eager to introduce you to space law, I ask you to indulge me first with a brief stroll through history. About three and a half million years ago, one of our common ancestors took a walk. We don't know why, we don't know exactly what day of the week it was, or even exactly what year it was. But when these footsteps were discovered at a site called Lytoli in Tanzania, they caused tremendous excitement. These are recognized as the very first footsteps humankind made upright on only two feet. Unfortunately, the footprints raise far more questions than they answer, and yet these footprints are cherished, studied, and preserved. They're actually reburied and then excavated from time to time as the scientists deem appropriate or necessary. Why go through all this trouble? Because they are a memorial to our past. They remind us of where we came from, they teach us about ourselves, and they inspire us to continue to evolve and move forward. To paraphrase Robert Penn Warren, while history cannot give us a program for the future, it can give us a fuller understanding of ourselves and of our common humanity so that we can better face the future. The international community has embraced the need for preservation of cultural her heritage well here on Earth. In 1959, sorry, I'm just going to move this. Um, in 1959, Egypt had to make an agonizing decision. In order to promote and accelerate the modernization of its economy, it needed to harness the power of the Nile River. Unfortunately, the plan to build what is now known as the Aswan High Dam would result in the creation of a vast lake, a lake which would assure the obliteration of 3,000-year-old temples and monuments, footprints of an ancient civilization known as Nubia, 
often called one of the cradles of human civilization. But that didn't happen. Instead, more than 50 nations came together, contributing funds and technical expertise. They didn't let these temples drown. Instead, they physically moved them piece by piece to higher ground. Why? As Russell Train recognized, preservation is a compelling idea that can help unite people rather than divide them. It is an idea that can help build a sense of community among people throughout the world. Recognizing that we humans must assume a common responsibility toward the past in order to move in unity toward a successful future, 193 nations have ratified the World Heritage Convention. 193 nations have agreed that our history here on Earth must be preserved. Almost 50 years ago, on 20 July 1960, two humans took a walk on the moon. It was an achievement <coughs> unparalleled in history. The site where these footsteps lay, undisturbed, are the first archaeological sites with human activity that are not on Earth. They bear witness to some of the most important technological developments in human history. They tell a story of science, technology, and culture, and serve to capture the imagination. And they memorialize the work of the hundreds and thousands of scientists and engineers throughout human history who have studied or endeavored to reach the stars. And yet, only one of these footprints is protected by international law, any law for that matter, recognized by the international community as part of a heritage site and carefully preserved with periodic reburial. Does that make sense to you? We don't think so. The narrative of human history on the moon starts in 1959 with a spacecraft called Luna 2. On 12 September 1959, it crash landed on the moon becoming the first item humans placed on an extraterrestrial surface, ever. Along with its scientific instruments, Luna 2 carried a stainless steel sphere, like this one, made up of medallions stamped with the name of the Soviet Union and the year. When Luna 2 impacted the moon, the sphere was ejected and the medallions were scattered across the lunar surface, where they remain undisturbed and unprotected to this day. 24 Luna missions followed Luna 2 to the moon or its vicinity, including nine, Luna 9, which made the first ever soft landing on the moon, and Luna 17, which landed on the moon in 1970, carrying Luna Cod 1, the first successful rover to explore another world, and yes, make the very first extraterrestrial ter wheel tracks. The remnants of all these missions remain unprotected on the moon. Of course, Apollo 11 is perhaps the best known moon landing site. In all, there were five Apollo missions carrying humans to the moon, each with its own breakthroughs and firsts. Apollo 12 was the first mission to retrieve human-made material from the moon when astronaut Charles Conrad brought back to Earth parts of Surveyor 3, a robot which had landed on the moon two years before. On the Apollo 14 mission, uh, who had its launching anniversary yesterday, after collecting 94 pounds of rocks, astronaut Alan Shepard became the first and so far only human to shank a, f a golf ball on the moon. Apollo 15 was the first crewed mission to land in the lunar highlands and significantly improved our understanding of lunar geologic structure and processes. And Apollo 17 was the final mission of the Enterprise. Landing on the moon on 11 December 1972, Apollo 17 boasts the first scientist in space, geologist Harrison Schmidt. It also marks the last time humans traveled beyond low Earth orbit. Humans have left many more items on the moon. Apollo 11 astronauts left a golden olive branch, as well as a silicon disk bearing messages of hope and peace from the leaders of 74 nations. Charlie Duke left a picture of his family. The crew of Apollo 15 placed this fallen astronaut and plaque on the moon to commemorate the astronauts and cosmonauts known to have died as of 1971 in the advancement of space exploration. And rumor has it, there's a tiny museum on the moon. Moon Museum is a small ceramic wafer, three quarters of an inch by half an inch, containing artworks by six prominent artists from the late 1960s, including Rob, Robert Rauschenberg, David Navros, John Chamberlain, Kleis Oldenburg, and Andy Warhol. The wafer was supposedly covertly attached to the leg of the Intrepid landing module and left on the moon during Apollo 12. If true, the Moon Museum is the first space art object. 
In addition to things being left behind by humans, are those being sent by humans. It's been estimated that there are more than 80 sites containing human material on the moon, including the site where the Chinese U-2 rover came to rest and the impact sites where the Luna Ranger Surveyor and a host of other uncrewed missions came to an end. Even these uncrewed missions left poignant reminders behind. In 1999, Lunar Prospector placed some of the ashes of Eugene Shoemaker, one of the founders of the field of planetary science on the moon. These are the first human, or known human, remains to be placed off Earth. Clearly, the moon holds a bounty of cultural heritage on numerous sites, instruments, personal items, and yes, human waste and other debris that can reveal the truths and facts of each moon landing. While the testimony of the moonwalkers and the engineers and scientists who commanded the rovers and orbiters are invaluable, a narrative cannot help but be clouded by the perspective of the storyteller. This is not a bad thing, it's a human thing. But having the ability to study the objects will lend even more truth and dimension to humanity's remarkable journey to the stars. The sites and the artifacts are an archeologist's dream. They confirm humans as an exploratory, migratory animal. They are frozen in time, undisturbed by wind or rain, and untouched by any other human or any living organism since. Since these artifacts and sites play such a vital role in our history, you'd think they'd be well cataloged. If only that were true. As archeologists and anthropologists have worked to refine and pursue the subfield of space archeology, span they shed light on an inconvenient truth. The treaty regime guiding outer space activities is silent with respect to the management, conservation, and preservation of our human and cultural heritage in space. Indeed, not only do the treaties provide little clarity, <coughs> their provisions raise more questions than they address. This is how the Apollo 11 mission is listed on the United Nations Registry of Space Objects. That's right, the lunar module isn't even mentioned. Under international treaties, nations only need share the objects they are launching into orbit. So here the US simply listed the Saturn V rocket that sent Apollo 11 to the moon. The UN registry identifies only 46 objects with status on moon. Apollo 11 is not one of them. Their descriptions range from development of spaceflight techniques and technology for Apollo, 11, uh, Apollo 12 to space research and exploration. This vagueness is not the fault of the UN. After all, the organization can only register the information and data they have been given. The US keeps its own detailed register of items left on the moon, which can be accessed online. Like I said, it is far more detailed, but the list has no international legal status. In short, there is no international agreement or even consensus as to what human objects are even on the moon at this point. And today that matters more than ever. Because we are finally going back. China returned several weeks ago, and if things go as planned, Space IL and India will be there this winter. At least three private companies, PT Scientists, Team Indus, and Astrobotic, have their site, uh, sites on a robotic return by 2020, and many space agencies are looking to return humans by 2030. It's going to get crowded really fast, and right now there is no accountability, there is no recognition, there's no protection for our cultural heritage sites on the moon, and there's no accepted concept of property. It's not hard to imagine cultural artifacts being removed and sold, or the sites themselves being harmed by careless human activity and action. <coughs> Someday, right? <coughs> Already, there is massive confusion regarding who owns what where. Lunacod 2, which landed on the moon in 1973, was purchased from the Soviet Union by Richard Garriott in 1993, making Garriott, as he has noted, the world's only private owner of an object on a foreign celestial body. So does he own the parcel of the moon beneath it? Does he own the tire tracks it made? Unclear. <coughs> What about property that has been to the moon or parts of the moon that have made it back to Earth? 18 months ago, this bag was sold by a private citizen for $1.8 million. The bag is a trifecta of firsts. It's the first moon bag, which collected the first moon sample and was collected by the first moon walker. Yet this bag, which still contained moon dust when it was sold, was lost by the government and ended up completely legally in the hands of a private citizen who chose to sell it to a private and anonymous buyer. 
Incidentally, she's now suing the government because the government had custody for it for several years. Um, and she believes that the government uh, took some of the moon dust that was in it out of it, which reduced the price. She was hoping to get $4 million for the bag, and she only got $1.8 million. <laughs> so um, in any case, if the government can lose track of this bag at a time when return, when return missions from the moon were rare, imagine what will happen when multiple private companies and countries are going back and forth, like, as Jeff Bezos has said, a regular shipping service. Sure. How, how does how does something how, how does that become okay that it's in private hands? Period. Ever it was government <laughs> property. They never relinquished ownership of it because somebody stole it and decided to sell it privately. How did how did that? So the the um, owner the line of ownership is actually really interesting. The uh, the Smithsonian loaned it to a museum in Kansas. And the curator of the museum in Kansas um, was indicted for fraud. And so as he uh, tried to, uh, as the museum tried to cover the expenses they lost and all the money, they put a lot of items up for sale, including the bag. Because the curator in Kansas, they didn't keep good enough records to know that it was part of that. So it's considered abandoned by the government because it was put up for sale. So she bought it, she bought it for, uh, uh, Nine hundred and thirty dollars. So wrong with that. there is absolutely something wrong with that. I I couldn't agree more. Um, and one of the things we want to do is by having these sites named heritage sites, universal heritage sites, the artifacts become actual artifacts, and then you can't own them. Um, they they fall under the international hierarchy of artifacts. You can't traffic them. You can't sell them. You can't trade them. Um, so that, that's something that's, that we really need to get in place before we start having a lot of return missions. Um, last fall, an interesting case emerged also in Kansas City. It stems from a gift received by Laura Ann Murray Kitchiko back in 1972. Laura Ann claims that Neil Armstrong, who was a close friend of her father, gave her a small vial of moon dust. Even though NASA has made no claims on the vial, Laura Ann has sued the U.S. government to obtain a declaratory judgment of ownership. The media has rather irresponsibly repeated statement, the statement that NASA's position is that all lunar material belongs to the nation, and by extension that no private individual can own a piece of the moon. Now I know I'm a lawyer, but I can't be the only one who finds this statement rash. All lunar material cannot possibly belong to the nation. How could a private party possibly make money mining the moon if all material belongs to the state. The distinction, of course, is that the media is talking about lunar material that has been returned to Earth via NASA projects. Sadly short-sighted and indicative of the general public's lack of awareness of the many exciting plans being made to return to, settle, and perhaps one day mine the moon. Whatever the court decides about this vial, and Laura May certainly found a clever way to generate interest in her moon dust in advance of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, the question will still remain whether a private entity can own a piece of or resources extracted from or objects on the moon. So who owns the artifacts? Who has the rights <coughs> to the sites? Who owns the moon? Well, there are probably about 37 million different answers to those questions. Which brings us to space law. The term space law is most often associated with the rules, principles, and standards of international law appearing in the five international treaties and five sets of principles governing outer space, which have been developed under the auspices of the United Nations. It's important to note that while there are five treaties, only four are widely ratified, and only four are ratified by the United States. The Moon Agreement is somewhat of an ugly stepchild that has never been brought into force. Nevertheless, the first four are incredible feats of negotiation hashed out against the backdrop of the Cold War. The men, yes, all white men, who negotiated these treaties must be congratulated, celebrated, and respected, because they have provided for nearly six decades a framework that has kept our terrestrial squabbles from turning into space wars. I will focus my remarks on the Outer Space Treaty, which was the first. The next three treaties basically elucidate provisions of the Outer Space Treaty. The Liability Convention reaffirms that nations will be liable to each other if their space objects damage another. The Registration Convention seeks to register all objects in space, 
though we've seen from the Apollo 11 um, that that doesn't really capture all objects in space. And the Return and Rescue Agreement reaffirms the concept that astronauts are envoys of all humankind, and each state has the obligation to rescue and return astronauts to their own nations. The Return and Rescue Agreement also makes clear that if a space object falls within your territory, you must return it to its owner. So there's no abandonment in space. Anything that goes up into space remains um, the property of the, the person or the nation that put it there. But before there were any laws, there was Sputnik. On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union launched Earth's first artificial satellite, Sputnik 1. Prior to Sputnik, the legal status of outer space was unclear. The conventional wisdom was that the rules that governed airspace would simply be extended upwards to Earth orbit once humanity began operating in that domain. And from as early as 1919, international air law provided that a nation's sovereignty extended vertically to the airspace over its territory. So you can't fly over another nation's airspace without that nation's permission. If this rule extended to outer space, the Soviet Union would have violated international law by launching Sputnik into an orbit which passed over many countries, including the United States, without permission. Nevertheless, President Eisenhower, knowing that the United States was interested in eventually overflying Soviet airspace with its own spy satellites, tacitly accepted the Soviet Union's right to operate a satellite in orbit over U.S. territory, and the rest of the world followed suit. Thus, because no one objected to the flyover by Sputnik, it became established that the rules that governed spacecraft would differ from those that governed aircraft, and space law was born. President Eisenhower was also a staunch proponent of keeping space open and peaceful. He was a driving force in the negotiation of the Outer Space Treaty, which can be viewed not as a constitution for space, but more like the Declaration of Independence. It provides guiding principles, the chief amongst of which are the principles of free exploration, free access, and free use by all states, all nations. Space is the province of all humankind. This is key. Space is not a global commons. It is the province of all humankind. Many in the international legal community believe that a global commons suggests that everyone must share in the bounty. A province simply suggests that everyone has equal access to that bounty. It is, it is this Article 1 that permits the concept of remote sensing. So when a satellite flies over and images uh, the, the, the land of another nation. While many nations objected to having satellites overhead imaging their nations instead of just flying over, the international community has agreed through the promulgation of remote sensing principles that every nation has the right to send a satellite into orbit and explore, even if that means exploring the territory of other sovereign nations here on Earth. So freedom of exploration, free access, you can go anywhere you want in orbit, and when you're in orbit, you can do anything except uh, shoot other people down, which, which we'll see in Article 4. That said, the treaty is equally clear that nothing in outer space is subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty. This means in no uncertain terms that no nation can claim ownership of any property in space. But again, note, it says no nation. It does not say no individual or entity. Again, however, this remains a topic of international legal debate. And what does by any other means mean? The U.S. can't make the uh, landing sites national parks because that would be claiming sovereignty over those sites. Um, what if an asteroid company incorporated in the U.S. stakes a claim to part of an asteroid? Is this by any other means? Article 3 requires that activities in space be conducted in accordance with international law. And Article 4 is the peacekeeping provision. The treaty prohibits placing nuclear weapons or WMD in orbit on any celestial bodies or in outer space. But notably, it's silent about conventional weapons. Space shall be used exclusively for peaceful purposes, the article says. No military bases are allowed. But you can use military personnel for peaceful purposes. Of course, there is no definition of a peaceful purpose. Yes? Um, I notice it says no nuclear weapons in orbit, but would it consider, say, uh, an ICBM in a ballistic trajectory, would that consider it it's not in orbit. orbit. Right. It's not in orbit. No. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. 
It do, and it doesn't say, it says you cannot place weapons in orbit. It doesn't say you can't use orbit to get weapons from one place to another. Yes? So despite this, obviously many nations pay attention to space and satellites for military purposes, for surveillance. How does that interplay with this, and how does this impact things like the Space Force? So that's my next slide. Space Force is my next slide. But the, um, the, we, we have weaponized space long ago when we used it to uh, spy on other nations. We use them in um, all of our uh, current wars. Um, we, we would be, our, our, our soldiers would be lost without space. So um, the, you cannot put weapons in space. That is the only thing that the treaty says. And so the international community is working hard to figure out how to not weaponize space. But now there are so many things you can do that aren't even weaponry now. Cyber attacks, laser attacks, <coughs> jamming, spoofing. Um, it's really ver getting very difficult to determine um, what, what is a weapon. It's also difficult to determine because a lot of the satellites are uh, dual purpose. So we're going to send up satellites that remote sense for disasters, like the Brazilian dam bust, and also happen to be looking for Brazilian military um, for, uh, forces. So um, it, it, this is an area of international law. You know, we, we cannot put nuclear weapons or WMD in orbit, but a lot of other things can happen. So the uh, private actors are um, under the authorization and supervision of the country where they are incorporated or where they're from. So it would be up to the country to make sure that whatever they've authorized into space doesn't violate the law. Um, the uh, space law right now is very country, uh, nation focused. And so all of the laws are directed to nations. And this is something we're trying to work on at the University of Mississippi. But right now, if somebody, if, if Elon Musk's Tesla hits another satellite, the United States is liable for that. So that would be if somebody were able to get a missile or some kind of weaponry into space, it would be up to that nation to figure out how to um, deal with it. Uh, which brings us, I'm often asked um, if a US Space Force would be a violation of international law. So when you think of a Space Force, a lot of people imagine Star Wars and great space dogfights and dramatic explosions. In reality, a space force will be made up of computer geeks, people who will track satellites and space debris and track their trajectories to determine their purpose uh, and their uses. People who will work to figure out not how to weaponize satellites, but how to protect them from non-traditional warfare threats like lasers or cyber attacks. This space force is not a violation of international law. And incidentally, this space force already exists in China, whose entire space program is run by the People's Liberation Army. Article 5 of the Outer Space Treaty recognizes astronauts as envoys of humankind, but fails to define an astronaut. Will space tourists be considered envoys of all humankind? Similarly, Article 6 states that nations, as I said, shall bear international responsibi responsibility for national activities in outer space, whether such activities are carried on by governmental agencies or by non-governmental entities, and must both authorize and supervise all such activity. It is this provision that has required the licensing system that the U.S. has implemented through the FAA, FCC, and NOAA for all commercial space activity. One thing the law is clear on is who owns the objects in space. Pursuant to Article 8 of the Outer Space Treaty, the items left on the moon, everything from the lunar roving vehicles to cameras to the photo left by astronaut Charlie du Charles Duke of his family, remain under the jurisdiction ownership and control of the nation that was responsible for putting them there. Yet Article 7 of the Outer Space Treaty and Article 3 of the Liability Convention states that entities can be liable in the event of damage being caused to a space object. So what is consider considered damage to a space object if the object is already non-operational? So if somebody runs over Neil Armstrong's footprints and to take a peek at the, uh, the eagle, they haven't done any damage to an operational space object. Does this mean, and does this mean objects cannot be, be moved at all? This raises a whole different set of issues as leaving objects in situ essentially results in perpetual occupation of the surface upon which they rest. Do we really think that any resources sitting under Chang'e 3 automatically belong to China? 
In any case, this runs afoul of the principle of non-appropriation encapsulated in Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty. This article also is increasingly important in terms of orbital debris. In 2009, a privately owned communication, U.S. communications satellite uh, owned by Iridium was hit by a defunct Russian military satellite, destroying both. The liability issues were handled privately, but this could have turned into a diplomatic event. More and more collisions like this will occur as our orbit continues to get more crowded. And eventually, uh, an, an, sorry, an eventuality that the international community has tried to address through debris mitigation principles but likely remain a, remain a danger until true debris remediation strategies are put in place. So our orbits are getting crowded, and every time there's a collision, uh, we get more and more pieces of junk up there. When, when uh, China had their ASAT test, they, uh, I think it's like three, they pop propagated three million pieces of junk. And that's really terrifying because a piece of junk the size of a dime can cripple the ISS or any satellite. And there's no way to, if, if the ISS is hit by a, pe a paint fleck, it scratches the windows. How are we gonna figure out whose paint fleck that was? You know, how are we gonna deal with these kind of liability issues? There's, there's nothing that we can do at this point in time. Um, it is also clear that any object removed from the moon or space must be returned to the state of origin. But does this mean any country can remove the object of another from the moon or for, from space so long as they return it to the nation of origin? And what does this mean for the artifacts in space? So if we believe this is correct, then anybody can go up and, and grab Charlie Duke's photo and bring it back and say, here, I brought it back for you. And we don't want that to happen either. And from a heritage standpoint, it is important to note that while the objects remain the property of the nation that put them there, the first landing sites themselves are not covered by the treaties at all. Thus, there's nothing stopping anyone or any rover from running over the first boot prints or rover tracks or erasing them outright, whether by accident or on purpose. Now, it has been suggested to me on multiple occasions that the sites and objects, whether they are heritage artifacts or not, are protected well under Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, which requires all activities in outer space be conducted with due regard to the corresponding interests of all other states' parties, which arguably suggests that other states should not interfere with or otherwise despoil the objects or sites of another. Well, we've seen how well due regard and common sense work here on Earth. During the government shutdown, vandals took advantage of the fact that there were no rangers in Joshua Tree Park and cut down the trees. And th this is human behavior. This is who we are. And last year, after viewing a traveling exhibit of the exquisite Xi'an terracotta warriors of China, a young man slipped in, in Philadelphia slipped back into the exhibit and broke one of the fingers of the warriors off. He kept it in his desk drawer. When the vandalism was discovered and he was apprehended, he simply shrugged and said he did it because he could. So clearly, due regard, which is an untested, undefined legal principle, is not going to form the basis of property ownership or heritage protection in space. So while we have a framework for space activities um, in international law, it fails to address many new space issues, the primary one of which is with regards to property still. Here are the few of the questions space law can't yet answer. Can wealthy CEOs simply launch whatever they want into space or on the moon or another celestial body even if it serves no scientific or economic purpose? Obviously, we have an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> if so, can that object be moved by an entity that seeks to utilize the resources under it? What about the ashes of our dearly departed? Right now, only Eugene Shoemaker's ashes, and only a small portion thereof, have been placed on the moon. But a number of companies, like Astrobotic, are offering to place ashes of loved ones on the moon. These companies are promising that ashes will rest in peace, undisturbed forever. Are these space objects that cannot be disturbed? Should the moon have a designated graveyard? If somebody's ashes are sitting on a, a mine, a water a mine, should we not be able to move them? What if the space resource utilization activity creates a visual impact on Earth? Say, for example, the moon looks different after certain, mi certain mining operations. While the reality of this occurring, especially in our lifetime, is slim, 
you'd be surprised how many people express concern that the moon will look different if we mine it. And what about aesthetics? Remember, when, when we are talking about util utilizing space resources, we are almost certainly talking about permanently altering other worlds. Are there any justifications for preventing space use because of natural landscape formations? Here on Earth, the World Heritage Convention protects sites of natural beauty and significance. Should each site on celestial bodies be given the same consideration before use is permitted? What about asteroids that hold scientific value? Take, for example, the Oumuamua asteroid. Someday I'll say it right. If a private corporation reaches it first, can it start to mine it? Or should it be preserved for scientific analysis? How do we decide? Yeah, space law is a mess and one that the governments of nations around the world seem loath to discuss. The last time nations were able to agree on anything in space was in the early 1970s. The Moon Agreement was the last treaty to be, treaty to be negotiated, and it has only 18 signatories. The biggest impediment to the execution of the Moon Agreement are four words, common heritage of mankind. The Law of the Sea Treaty considers mineral resources of the sea to be common heritage of mankind, to be administered for the benefit of mankind as a whole. So all mineral exploration and exploitation activities must be by, sponsored by a state party and approved by the International Seabed Authority. The regulations promulgated by that authority have been regarded by commercial entities as particularly onerous and burdensome, and many argue that its existence is the very reason humanity has not yet taken advantage of the rich resources the ocean beds have to offer. Because common heritage of mankind, according to the Law of the Sea Treaty, means that whatever you mine, you have to give a large percent back to mankind, back to the UN, to divvy up with everybody. <coughs> In any event, none of the US, Russia, or China has signed the Moon Agreement, and it is highly unlikely that the US will accept an agreement that has the potential to infringe on the rights of its citizens to use space resources for commercial purposes. After all, if you take away the potential return, why would anyone make the investment? So let's step back and think about property on the moon. What impediments are there to the establishment of an international framework which will recognize property rights in space? There are a lot of things for nations to disagree about. Should an international framework deal with potential environmental damage? Some argue the moon is dead. Nothing needs to be protected. Others say there are some natural formations that we ought to protect. Also questions abound regarding the impact of mining on the moon. Will removing large amounts of matter cause tidal or other uh, challenges here on Earth? Ethical concerns also abound. What do we owe to future generations? How much voice should be given to those who venerate the moon as part of their culture? Don't forget when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, a, uh, a uh, group of native Canadians protested vehemently. We can't, uh, we can't forget that certain groups oppose landing anything on the moon because of their belief in the need for it to remain pure and untainted by nature, by humans. Should regulations consider um, impacts of my, visual impacts of mining? What about lunar heritage? our human history on the mood? Should international regulations protect those first footsteps? As discussed earlier, we have to consider the combined effects of Article 8 and Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty. What does due regard really mean? Non-spacefaring nations are, perhaps not irrationally, concerned that they will miss out on this new space race. They will likely block any international framework that does not include some sort of dispensation to them. While some would argue that this dispensation ought to be a share of profits or a tax or a fee based on profits that is shared, there are many other ways to include developing countries in space opportunities that will not require the levy of fines or tariffs. So that's a lot of issues to worry about. How can we possibly address, much less solve, any of them? Here's our view. The Outer Space Treaty is the foundational document of international space law ratified by 103 countries, including the United States, not including Iran or North Korea. The treaty is full of warm and fuzzy pronouncements requiring cooperation, mutual assistance, peaceful exploration, and free access. But it stops short of calling space a global commons, and that's an important distinction. Space is the province of all humankind, 
and not, as the Moon Agreement and the Law of the Sea Treaty have tried to aver, common heritage of humankind. That said, the treaty does clearly state that outer space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of any sovereignty. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, the treaty is silent in two important respects. First, it does not directly address private, um, that is non-sovereign appropriations. And second, it fails to consider how resources extracted from these celestial bodies should be treated. The U.S. sought to address this uncertainty recently implementing the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act of 2015, which explicitly states that any resources obtained in outer space are the property of the entity that obtained them. It also makes very clear that this same entity shall be entitled to all property rights to the resources, consistent with applicable federal law and existing international obligations. Luxembourg recently passed a similar law. UAE is also considering a law with comparable provisions, and my understanding is that Japan and China are also considering this language. <coughs> so how can we resolve all these issues on an international level? By focusing on something we can and have already all agreed on, preservation. 193 nations have ratified the World Heritage Convention. Our ultimate goal is the ratification of a convention that will recognize and institute protections for sites in space. Rest assured, this does not mean zoning off great tracts of land on the moon for conservation or preservation purposes. It means finding a way to responsibly manage and balance preservation and development. The first step is, of course, identifying what we are talking about. And here's where it gets interesting. For All Moonkind is creating a decentralized grid referenced map of the moon. The primary goal of this map is to identify all the potential heritage sites and human artifacts on the moon. But the map will be both transparent and dynamic. We are working to obtain commercial buy-in so that um, this registry becomes the clearinghouse for new ventures. A company will come to us first to see if their proposed plan will impact a potential heritage site. And in so doing, it will notify the registry and the world where they plan to land and eventually prospect on the moon. The, the buy-in is built, is built in around the concept of preservation. We will bring nations to the table on the back of heritage. It will create a dynamic and transparent interaction. In the beginning, uh, exploration and development will continue on a bilateral basis. However, our hope is that we can convene an international committee or body that will help to address important questions regarding environmental protection and the ethical and moral decisions regarding mining. By making the registry available and transparent, we can also unite people around the concept of the universality of our heritage in space. Non-spacefaring nations are stakeholders in this process, and the concept of common heritage will be molded around this, the grid. The reality is that by identifying zones on the moon that we do not want disturbed, we are by extension agreeing that there are zones on the moon that can be disturbed or mined. In this way, the For All Mo Moonkind Registry is the first step to an international framework acknowledging, supporting, and confirming the existence, or at least the possibility, <coughs> of individual property rights. And so you see, only by walking through history can we protect our future. Neil Armstrong was the first human on the moon. His bootprint, like those first footprints found in Tanzania, are indeed a giant leap. Three and a half million years ago, our common ancestor decided to stand up. And 50 years ago, the common ancestor of our spacefaring progeny stepped off an eagle and into history. In 1993, journalist J.G. Ballard speculated that Neil Armstrong <coughs> may well be the only human being of our time remembered 50,000 years from now. If we do this right, 50,000 years from now, not only will his name be remembered, his bootprint will remain preserved, and the story of how Tranquility Base became the cradle of our spacefaring future will be forever remembered, along with the lessons of the tumultuous history that got <coughs> us to the moon. Lessons that will help us, ultimately, advance forward as a species. Thank you.